Welcome back to QBank Pro Academy. Please check out our resources in the description below that includes links to a free NCLEX course and to our website that has practice exams, quizzes, flashcards, and more. Let's get started. A prima gravida patient asks when her nausea and morning sickness will resolve. The nurse correctly answers. A. Nausea usually resolves within four weeks. B. Nausea usually resolves within two months. C. Nausea usually resolves at 10 weeks. D. Nausea usually resolves at 14 to 16 weeks. The correct answer is D. Nausea usually resolves at 14 to 16 weeks. Explanation. The most common symptoms of morning sickness are nausea and vomiting. Odors and higher environmental temperature may trigger these symptoms, or they may occur spontaneously without a trigger. It is most common during the first trimester. Rarely in some women, it may last throughout pregnancy. Which of the following are common findings during pregnancy? Select all that apply. A. Urinary frequency. B. Breast tenderness. C. Fever. D. Fatigue. The correct answer is A. Urinary frequency. B. Breast tenderness and D. Fatigue. Explanation. The most common signs of pregnancy are missed menstrual cycle, tender breasts, increased urination, tiredness, and morning sickness that may include nausea and vomiting. Lower back aches, headaches, food cravings, and bloating may also occur during the first trimester. What are Braxton Hicks contractions? A. Contractions that occur during labor. B. Contractions that occur during the third trimester associated with fetal distress. C. Contractions that occur throughout pregnancy that are associated with fetal distress. D. Contractions that occur throughout pregnancy that are not painful. The correct answer is D. Contractions that occur throughout pregnancy that are not painful. Explanation. Braxton Hicks contractions are normal during pregnancy. They are normally felt in the second and third trimester. Unlike labor contractions, Braxton Hicks contractions are usually not painful and they do not get stronger over time. They may stop when the patient changes activities or positions. The nurse is teaching a nursing student about assessment in pregnancy. Which of the following findings are signs of pregnancy? Select all that apply. A. Babinski sign. B. Chadwick's sign. C. Brudzinski sign. D. Hedger sign. The correct answer is B. Chadwick sign and D. Hedger sign. Explanation. Hedger sign is evident when there is compressibility and softening of the lower segment of the uterus. Both B and D are signs of pregnancy. A 36-year-old female presents to the clinic for a follow-up visit and a non-stress test. What is an example of the normal response to a stress test? A. Decelerations of 15 beats per minute lasting 15 seconds. B. Accelerations of 30 beats per minute lasting 30 seconds associated with fetal movement. C. Accelerations of 15 beats per minute lasting 15 seconds associated with fetal movement. D. Acceleration of 30 beats per minute lasting 15 seconds associated with fetal movement. The correct answer is C. Accelerations of 15 beats per minute lasting 15 seconds associated with fetal movement. Explanation. During a non-stress test that takes about 20 minutes, the healthcare provider may assess the baby's heartbeat and the mother's contractions. You may expect the baby's heart rate to increase when moving or when waking up or becoming more active. The healthcare provider is determining the expected delivery date for a new patient. The first day of the patient's last menstrual period is October 21, 2022. What is the expected date of birth? A. 28 June 2023 B. 28 July 2023 C. 29 May 2023 D. 29 August 2023 the correct answer is B, 
28 July 2023. Explanation. B is the correct answer and can be calculated using Nagel's rule. The Nagel's rule is used to calculate the due date. Using a mathematical formula, we can estimate the delivery date. It should be considered as a guideline and not a definite due date. The nurse is teaching a nursing student about fetal assessment. The allotment refers to A. Lactation in response to suckling B. Rebounding fetus against the health care provider's finger with palpation C. Fetal heart rate deceleration in the third trimester, a sign of fetal distress D. Fetal heart rate acceleration at 20 to 22 weeks The correct answer is B. Rebounding fetus against the health care provider's finger with palpation Explanation Allotment is a palpation method of assessment during pregnancy. The examiner pushes upward against the uterus and is able to detect a movable mass within the abdomen. This maneuver can be used as part of the physical obstetric examination. The statement about assessment of a new patient by the nursing student indicates that she understands the meaning of the medical term parity. What does parity mean? A. The number of pregnancies carried past 20 weeks. B. The number of live births. C. The number of pregnancies. D. The number of miscarriages. The correct answer is A. The number of pregnancies carried past 20 weeks. Explanation. Parity refers to the number of pregnancies that reach a viable gestational age, 20 weeks of gestation. The pregnancies include live births or stillbirths. This question tests the student's understanding of obstetric terminology. A premogravida patient presents to the clinic for assessment of fetal development. What is the approximate fundal height at 36 weeks? A. The fundal height is approximately at the xiphoid process. B. The fundal height is approximately at the umbilicus. C. The fundal height cannot be determined at 36 weeks. D. The fundal height is halfway between the umbilicus and the xiphoid process. The correct answer is A. The fundal height is approximately at the xiphoid process. Explanation. Measuring fundal height is used to evaluate fetal growth and estimate gestational age. It is measured from the pubic symphysis to the top of the mother's uterus. At 36 weeks, the fundus of the uterus is at the mother's xiphoid process. The fundal height at 20 weeks is approximately at the umbilicus. What are interventions that may reduce heartburn during pregnancy? Select all that apply. A. Drinking one and a half liters per day. B. Eating three full meals per day. C. Avoid fatty, spicy foods. D. Stay upright for at least 30 minutes after eating a meal. The correct answer is C. Avoid fatty, spicy foods, and D. Stay upright for at least 30 minutes after eating a meal. Explanation. During pregnancy, changes in the gastrointestinal system include constipation, increased flatus, and heartburn. Some of these symptoms occur due to decreased gastrointestinal motility. Heartburn, or GERD, occurs more frequently in the second and third trimester. C and D may reduce symptoms, as well as eating small, frequent meals. There are several high-risk conditions associated with pregnancy. Gestational diabetes is one of the conditions that is frequently asked about on the board and licensure exam. Gestational diabetes occurs in women who have not been previously diagnosed with diabetes. It typically occurs in the second and third trimester. There are several risk factors that may be associated or increase one's risk of gestational diabetes. Two of these include obesity and being overweight. This includes a BMI of greater than 30, the risk is also increased in older women and with the risk of exogenous glucocorticoids or steroids. Pregnant women should be screened for gestational diabetes between 24 and 28 weeks. The good news is that gestational diabetes can frequently be treated by diet alone. Some patients, however, may require insulin. Some oral medications that are safe in pregnancy may be used. In women who are at risk for diabetes, screening may occur earlier in pregnancy. Additional risk factors 
include polycystic ovarian disease, women with previous delivery of a fetus weighing more than nine pounds, and women with a previous pregnancy with gestational diabetes. When gestational diabetes is initially diagnosed, the first treatment is diet. If diet alone is unable to control blood sugar levels, medications may be started. In addition to diet, physical activity should be encouraged. All women with gestational diabetes should be referred to a diabetic educator and a nutritionist. Patients need to be taught how to observe for signs of hyperglycemia, as well as hypoglycemia. It is important to monitor weight and for signs of infection. This should include monitoring for sore throat, skin infection, cough, and urinary tract infections. If signs of infection occur, the healthcare provider should be contacted. Frequent monitoring of fetus status is important. Monitoring for signs of fetal compromise. In women who have not been diagnosed with gestational diabetes who are at risk, one should monitor for excessive thirst, frequent urination, blurred vision, recurrent infections, notably recurrent urinary tract infections, glycosuria, excessive hunger, and polyhydramnios. We can summarize the importance of treatment in gestational diabetes. It is very important that it includes nutritional therapy, self-monitoring of glucose, and an attempt to maintain a target blood glucose level. Oftentimes, this cannot be accomplished by diet alone. Close monitoring and treatment reduces preeclampsia, as well as birth weight, greater than 4,000 grams, and shoulder dystocia. Primary goals of treatment include maintaining normoglycemia, preventing ketosis, and also providing adequate nutrition for both the mother and fetus. A typical meal plan for a patient diagnosed with gestational diabetes may include three small meals per day with snacks. Two to four snacks per day would be acceptable with adjustment based on blood glucose levels, appetite, and weight gain patterns. Keep in mind that the caloric requirements for patients with gestational diabetes are the same as those for individuals that do not have gestational diabetes. After providing a meal plan and diet, it is very important to monitor weight. Optimal outcomes are more likely in patients who have appropriate gestational weight gain. Excessive gestational weight gain is associated with significantly increased risk of having a large or gestational age newborn, preterm birth, and cesarean birth. A typical protocol for monitoring blood glucose levels in a patient with gestational diabetes includes measuring the blood sugar before breakfast, obtaining a fasting blood glucose level, and again, one hour after each meal. Hemoglobin A1c may be useful as an ancillary test. What are some indications for starting pharmacotherapy in patients with gestational diabetes? One indication for starting pharmacotherapy might be that glucose levels are consistently above the target range for the patient. If blood sugar levels cannot be maintained by diet and exercise alone, pharmacotherapy may be started. Another indication for starting pharmacotherapy in a patient with gestational diabetes may be ultrasound findings suggesting that the fetus is large for gestational age. In other words, evidence of macrosomia on ultrasound may be a reason for starting pharmacotherapy. There are a number of options for pharmacotherapy in patients with gestational diabetes. Perhaps the most common is insulin or one of the insulin analog drugs. Many obstetricians favor insulin because it is easily adjusted and felt to be safe in pregnancy. What is the long-term outcome in patients with gestational diabetes? After giving birth, most patients' gestational diabetes will resolve, and they will be normal glycemic, although they are at high risk for recurrent gestational diabetes. We know that gestational diabetes may be a predictor and may increase one's risk of developing cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. For that reason, in patients who have had gestational diabetes should get long-term follow-up 
for the development of type 2 diabetes.